my sin And who could carry that kind away Oh, it was my turn Till I gave And I was breathing but not alive And though my failures I tried
They say there's nothing new under the sun. Everything's already been done. So why try? Because your story has never been told, and it requires you to be bold before you build. It's time for your groundbreaking at a place that embraces big dreams, that pushes you to your best and launches you into your destiny. Bold Vision, Oral Roberts University. Good morning, ORU. Everybody doing all right? Good to be in chapel today. We're excited always to have a special guests with us in chapel today. We have two wonderful friends all the way from Germany, Marcus and Elsie Vince. Uh, Marcus, would you stand up and Elsie over here? They're wonderful friends, Gospel Forum and Holy Ghost Nights across Europe, great ministers of young people. Uh, we got a lot of young, uh, significant voices in these next few days at chapel. You're gonna be very blessed today. We have with us one of my favorite preachers in the whole world, Sarah Castellanos. <clears throat> Sarah is the youth pastor along with her husband of MCI Church, Mission Carismatica Internacional in Bogota, Colombia. MCI is a thriving church with locations around the world. Sarah also serves on the Empire 21 Next Gen Network. She has a degree in government and international relations and is currently working on her master's degree. She loves serving her city and above everything else, she's a passionate follower of Jesus. Sarah, uh, her father, her whole family have led um, G12, which is a network of churches literally around the globe, prolifically multiplying uh, for Jesus Christ. They are a powerful network, a powerful ministry, and a powerful church. And Sarah is happily married to Lau uh, and his mom to Isaac, Annabella, Zara Esther, and Victoria, who is now 10 months old. We are delighted and honored to have Sarah Castellanos with us. Would you get on your feet and welcome Sarah to the stage. Why don't you give Jesus a big hand of praise? Amen. You may be seated. I'm honored to be here always. I think last time I was here, I only had one kid, and now I came back with four. So a lot happened in four years. <laughs> a lot happened, and I'm happy. <laughs> And I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. It's always a privilege, a privilege to just share with the body of Christ, everyone reunited from many nations, different denominations, but all passionate for Jesus Christ. Amen? I want you to pray with me before we start. Let's just give this time to the Lord. Father, I thank you for this wonderful time here. I pray that you may speak over our lives. I pray that it may be your word, not mine. And I pray that this word may truly transform everything that we are. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Say amen. God placed a message on my heart. And I believe just as it changed me, it can change you. I was asking myself... We are living in crazy times. How many of you see the world and you just say things, my gosh, what's going on with the world? Things are just getting worse and worse. Sin is everywhere. And I was praying one day and I'm like, Lord, what's your answer? What, what should be our, our response to what we see in the world? What should be the action, the attitude we must have? And as I was praying one day, God said, I wanna lift up an Esther generation. And that is the message that God placed in my heart for you today. God is looking for an Esther generation. The question is, will you and I be that Esther generation? For us to understand a little more what God is looking for, we need to go to the book of Esther. You know, Esther is the only book in the Bible where the word or the name of God is not mentioned, but you see God everywhere. And you see God through the life of Esther. Let's read Esther chapter 1 verse 12. It says, but when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. The Lord started speaking to me and said, before I can lift up Esther, before Esther comes in the picture, I had called someone else. I had, I had called Vashti. 
Vashti was called by the king. She had a duty. She was supposed to serve the king. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're saying, Jesus, you are the king of our lives, right? That means we obey who? We obey Jesus. Queen Vashti had to obey her king. But she allowed different things that disqualified her. Disqualified her from serving her king. We see a few things in Queen Vashti. Three things I want to mention quickly. Queen Vashti forgot who had called her. She forgot who had given her that position. Queen Vashti thought she had a right. You know, we live in a world where everything is about rights. Everyone has a right. It's my right. It's my life. It's what I want to do. And because of this mindset, Queen Vashti did what she wanted. She said, the king is telling me to do this, but I don't want it. It's my life. It's what I want to do. Queen Vashti disobeyed. She was called. She was in the position. She had access to the king. But when the king told her to do something, she simply said, I don't want to. You know, we live in a world where we call ourselves Christians. We say we serve the only true king. But the Christian life can be summarized in a life of obedience. And sometimes God is going to tell us to do things we don't want to do. Sometimes God is going to tell us, hey, leave that relationship. Do that for me. And that is the moment where you're going to show where your heart truly is. You know, Queen Vashti's heart was never truly with the king because she just wanted to do her own thing. She wanted to live her own life. We live in a generation consumed by selfies. You know, I, I saw an article, very interesting, that said that approximately there are 200 deaths per year because of selfies. People trying to go to weird places, extreme places, they're trying to take a selfie and they end up dying. That's crazy. 200 lives consumed with the selfie world. If we take a look at your Instagram, what are we going to find? A lot of selfies? We are consumed by the selfie generation. And Queen Vashti was part of this generation. She always thought about herself. Let's continue reading. Esther chapter 1 verse 15. It says, according to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? He asked. She didn't obey. She has not obeyed the command of the king that the eunuchs have taken to her. There's always consequences to our disobedience. Esther 119, therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of king, of the king. And here I'm referring, in the, I'm gonna refer to this as our king. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. When Vashti failed, God raised an Esther. When King Saul failed, God raised a David. You know, Esther wasn't God's first option. God's first option was Vashti. A few years ago, I had the privilege to meet evangelist Reinhard Bonnke. He invited us to his house. We were sitting for lunch and he shared an experience that truly marked my life. He was sharing how one time God told him, I want you to write the gospel in a small booklet and I want you to send it to every single house in Germany. It seemed crazy, expensive, and just crazy. And he said, wow, Lord, that's, that's crazy, but I'll do it. But I just have one question. Why me? And then he tells me, and you know what God said? Son, you weren't my first option. You were my third. Vasi had the opportunity, but she simply said, I don't want. And she lost two things. To understand what she lost, I want to read Revelations chapter 1, verse 5 through 6. Look at what it says. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and here we see the gospel, to him who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, what we were just singing. 
Jesus saves us. He washes us with his blood, but he does it with a purpose. And he has made us kings and priests. Say that with me, kings and priests. Everything God did, the whole purpose of the gospel, he loved us, he washed us, but he made us kings and priests to his God and Father. What does a priest do when we read the Old Testament? The function of a priest was to present himself in the presence of God, to offer sacrifices. The functions of a king was to fulfill a duty. What were the consequences of Vashti's disobedience? She was never able to enter the presence, the function of a priest, and she lost her royal position. I want to tell you, Jesus loves us. He washes us with his blood, but he has a purpose for each and every one of us. We are on a mission on earth. He wants to make you a priest. A priest, you have access to his presence, but you also have a duty. We're on a mission here on earth and time is running out and we need to fulfill our God-given mission. We can't just play around. We can't just say, I'll serve God when I graduate. I'll serve God when I get married. I'll serve God in 20 years. Let me tell you, I don't know if we're gonna have 20 years because Jesus is coming back soon. And the church is on a mission and we need to take hold of it. How many of you say amen? amen. So after this, Esther comes in the picture. After, after Vashti disobeyed, God is looking for someone who is willing to do what the former generation, or perhaps leaders that God called, didn't do. Esther chapter two, verse seven, it says, and Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor, nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. I see several things with Esther. The first thing I see is Esther didn't let her past determine her future. She didn't fall under the victimized column. Oh, I'm an orphan. I can't do anything. God can't use me. I don't understand why this happened to me. My life is so hard because now everything is you're a victim, right? You're a victim. Oh, poor me, poor that. If she had been with that attitude, she wouldn't have been able to fulfill what God was calling her to do. The second thing I see is Esther had true beauty. True beauty was the one that God placed in her. Not the beauty the world shows. She had true beauty. The third thing I see was Esther was a true disciple, a true daughter to Mordecai. Mordecai took this place of a spiritual father and here I want to tell you, God is looking for an Esther generation that honors the Mordecais in their lives. Let me tell you, be faithful to the church God has planted you in. Be faithful to your leaders. Be faithful to your pastors because God honors when we are faithful. Today we see many leaders that want to do their own thing. That want to just, ah, I, I feel God is calling me, so I'm going to go and do my own ministry. Esther never did that. She was faithful. She knew the authority that Mordecai had on her life. Mordecai, have, they have experience. And I know God has lifted Mordecai's in your life to guide you, to disciple you, to tell you, hey, you're going the wrong way. Esther was a true daughter. Today we need to have that heart. That heart that honors, that heart that says, I'm going to be faithful. The apostle Paul, when he spoke to, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, Timothy, look for faithful men. If there is one thing our generation is lacking is faithfulness, faithfulness to be planted. Say with me, planted, say it louder, planted. Esther, before she was taken to that place of honor, she was faithful. She was faithful. When you are faithful in the little, God will put you and entrust you with much more. And the fourth thing I see with Esther, she accepted her calling. 
Esther chapter 2 verse 17, it says the king loved Esther more than all the other women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and make, made her queen instead of Vasti. Esther had that moment where she accepted her calling. God put her in that position. But a time came, just like Vasti, where she had to understand, understand why God had called her. I truly believe that God saves us for a reason. There is a purpose. And let me tell you, you have a purpose on this earth. God has given us access to be priests, to be in his presence every day. Every day, today, by the blood of Jesus, we can have access to the living God. And that is just amazing to grasp. But a lot of times we don't use the access we have. And when we're in his presence, we understand our duty. We understand what God, where God wants to put us. There came a, a, a time came where Esther, her faith, her obedience was put to the test. Look at what it says, Esther chapter four, verse seven through eight. We're going through the whole book of Esther here, but it's just for you to understand. It says, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, the sum of money that Haman, the enemy of the Jews, had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So again, Mar Mordecai comes. Mordecai represents that spiritual authority that pastor, that covering, the covering over her life. And Mordecai comes and says, Esther, I need you to see what's going on. I need you to open your eyes. I need you to see what's moving on around you because you're inside the palace. And a lot of times we can be inside the four walls of the church and we're not seeing what's going on outside our bubble. Mordecai says, I need you to open your eyes. I need you to see what's going on because there's a lot of money in place. It's money, yeah, but it's also destruction. Throughout history, there's always been a Haman, an enemy that wants to destroy us. Here, he wanted to destroy the Jews. What we're seeing today in Israel is exactly the same thing. There is a Haman that wants to destroy and kill God's people. You think it's going to stop with the Jews? Who are they going to come after? The Christians. Let me tell you, we need to open our eyes. We need to see that it is an attack to everything the Bible stands for. Everything that God stands for. I have a photo here of all the companies that give money to abortion. Practically every single company we know every single company we need to open our eyes every single company that sends money to planned parenthood right here do you see one you recognize or a few you recognize the following photo is what we're seeing in many universities not this one thank god but let me tell you something <laughs> not this one this is what's going on outside and we gotta wake up. We gotta wake up, generation. We gotta wake up because they're trying to kill everything that God stands for. I wanna show the next photo. This is true. This is what this generation, what Haman is trying to do. He's trying to kill that God created male and female. He's trying to kill. Okay, and we need to open our eyes to see this. We need to see the amount of money that is behind this. And that's exactly what Mordecai said. He's like, Esther, look at the amount of money, but look at what they're trying to do. 
I had the opportunity to see Sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom, Sound of Freedom was attacked by mainstream media. Why? Because of the money behind it. Take a look at the next photo. There are states in the United States where it's not even abortion now, up to eight weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks. This is a formed baby, heartbeat. DNA dif different from the mother's DNA, a human being. But there's places here in the world where after the baby is born, the mother can decide if she wants to abort him. That's not even abortion. The baby has been born already. This is happening. This wasn't something 10 years ago, 20. This is happening today. This is happening in our country. This is happening right under our noses. Let's take a look at the next photo. What flag are we lifting up? Because they're loud. They're loud. Oh, but it's their right. Remember Vasti? Her rights? Behind all of this, there is a Haman. There is a Haman. You know, Karl Marx, he started this ideology that was, it was a clash between the poor and the rich, you know? Put the poor against the rich. They just changed it a little now. Now it's the black against the white, the gays against the straight. It's the same thing. What did he believe in? This is a quote he used to say. He said, my object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. I want you to put the next slide. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. You're either pro-Israel or you're not. There is no middle ground. Let me tell you, we are living times where you need to be radical. I want to finish reading Esther chapter 4 verse 13 through, 12, through 14. And Mordecai, and God uses someone with experience. You know, God wants to use the older generation with the new generation. Don't just say, oh, I'm, we're the new generation. We don't need the older generation. No, we need them. You know, in the Old Testament, we see several moments where God uses two illustrations. And it's actually something that you see, not just in the Bible, but you put an old ox with a new ox, and that's how they set the ground. Why do you need the old ox? Because he knows the way, but he doesn't have the strength. And why do you need the new ox? Because he has the strength, but he doesn't know the way. If you put two young ox, they're just gonna fight each other. If you put two old ox, they don't have the strength. God wants to unite generations. Don't say, I don't need the older generation. We need the older generation. The older generation knows the way, but now God wants to use your strength. God wants to use your talents, but not on your own with the older generation. And God brings the older generation, Mordecai, and he says, Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace. Don't think you're gonna escape just because you call yourself a Christian and you sing all the nice songs here in church. Don't think you're going to escape. That's what Mor Mordecai said. Don't think that you can hide behind the title. Don't think you can hide behind the instrument, behind the songs, behind the career. Don't think you can escape. For if you remain completely silent... You know what has been our sin? That we're seeing everything and we're just quiet and silent. Our sin is not that we're part of it. Or maybe some are, I don't know. But our main sin 
is that when God is looking for someone to rise up and to be an Esther generation, we remain quiet. We said nothing. We stayed silent. And Mordecai said, if you remain completely silent, that's why I'm telling you, there is no middle ground. You're either a true Christian or you're not. There is no middle ground. Because if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows if you're living in such generation for such a time as this? Who knows if you're getting the education you're getting for such a time as this? Who knows if God saved you for such a time as this? Our world needs those Esthers that will understand their duty for such a time as this. And what is the call? It is a call to die. That's the Esther generation, a call to die. It's not very attractive. Look at what Esther chapter four, verse 16 says. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. It is a call to die. To be willing to lose your reputation, to lose your friends. It is a bold call. What did Jesus, what is his call to all of us? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. It says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The Phillips translation says, if you wanna be my disciple, you, want, you need to give up your right to self. What Vasti didn't do. It was a call to die. Esther was willing to die for her call. She was willing to lose everything and she the first thing she did was do a three-day fast. She humbled herself. And I believe in those three days of fasting, of putting her face on the ground, she died. Maybe of her dreams of being queen, because she could literally die. You know, being a Christian today, if you're a true Christian that stands up, it's not popular. It is, it is not popular. But are you truly willing to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Give up your right to self. You know, my third daughter, as Dr. Wilson said, I have four daughters, four kids, sorry. One son, three daughters. But with my third, her name is Zara Esther. When I got pregnant, I had no idea if it was gonna be a girl or boy. I found out it was a girl. And usually I know the name right away. God speaks to me and I know the name. But with Esther, I had no idea what her name was gonna be. So I was literally nine months pregnant. I had a huge belly. And you know, when you see someone pregnant, you usually ask, oh, what's their name, right? Everyone asked me, what's the baby's name? And I was like, I don't know. They're like, what? You're nine months pregnant, you don't know? I'm like, I don't know, we have no idea. God hasn't spoken to us. It was year 2020. My daughter was born January 1st, 2021. A good date, 1121. But Jan December 31st, I had a lot of complications. So I had COVID with 38 weeks. I literally, almost died. I got preclamps as well. If you're, you know what that is, that's like the worst thing that can happen to a pregnant person. A pregnant person, no, pregnant woman. Oh my gosh. Woman. <laughs> pregnant woman. <laughs> and I remember 
I'm in the hospital December 31st. No one wants to be in the hospital December 31st. And I'm there having the worst possible headache ever. I felt my, my head was going to explode. My husband is there next to me. Our New Year's, our countdown was there in the waiting room. And I'm just there with my hands over my head and I'm like, Lord, protect my baby. They do an ultrasound and they see that the amniotic liquid had practically vanished and she was getting nothing. So right away they induced me because her life was in danger. As we go through this process, I'm just praying for my, my child, my baby. And I start praying and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and he says, her name will be Esther right there because she's going to represent the generation that I'm going to lift up a bold generation that the enemy has been trying to kill so I'm there I go into labor it was my easiest labor she came out like in 30 seconds Woo, fast I'm like like that I can have 10 more easy <laughs> fast but after she was born I start having a hemorrhage. I lose around four liters of blood. The doctors, they called in the hospital, code red. All the doctors come. They take my husband outside, the baby outside. And I remember I was like almost fainting, but I see them surrounding my bed and they're just saying, we don't know what to do. We're losing her. And I'm like, no, Lord, they're not losing me. Come on, God, please. You're not losing me. No, no, no. God did a miracle because they didn't know how to stop the bleeding. They tried everything. But I saw the protection over my daughter. Last year with my same daughter, Esther, I found her in the pool of our house dead. She had drowned. She was one year and five months old. I find her there and I get her out of the water. She's completely gone. She was already floating. Water was already inside her body. And I get her and I start screaming. I called my husband. My husband comes, she get, he gets our daughter. He starts doing everything. He starts doing CPR. He starts doing mouth to mouth. He starts doing everything. And I start crying out in other tongues. And you know what I remember at that moment that my daughter was dead, was gone? I said, God, she is an Esther. She is the Esther generation and her time is not up. God, have mercy. And I start crying out in other tongues and I'm just crying out for my Esther, my daughter, my baby. The day before I found out I was pregnant, and the shock, the impact was so strong that day that all my back muscles got swollen. I had to go to the ER the following day. It was so strong what we lived emotionally. And I start crying out for my Esther and start crying out for resurrection. The car came in because we had no car. And my husband says, we need to go to the hospital. We go to the hospital. We're on our way to the car. I call my parents, my Mordecai's. And I say, I need you to cry out for resurrection. We start crying out around 25 minutes had gone by. 25 minutes is a lot. No oxygen was getting to her brain. My husband continued to do CPR, CPR. And the whole time I was just praying in other tongues. But in my mind, I was seeing Esther, you're gonna resurrect. As we're there crying out, my husband, he looks at me and he says, look at her because my eyes were closed. I didn't even wanna look at her. I was just seeing her in the eyes of faith. And my husband says, look, her, her color, it's changing. When a person dies, the first thing that changes is their skin color. I look and I see she's still not breathing. She's still not giving any sign, but her color starts to come. 
And then she does the first sign of life. She starts trying to breathe. And I start like cheering. I'm like, come on, you can do it. Come back, come back, breath of life. And I'm there like doing this strength. Come on, Zara, come on. Her name is Zara Esther, come on. And finally, it was like from zero to 100, pa. She starts crying. And she didn't stop crying for three hours. Her body went in shock. Her arms were tense, her legs were tense. We get to the hospital, they say, well, okay, she's back, but she's gonna have this, this, and this, and this, because oxygen didn't go to her brain. But I said, the God who resurrected Lazarus didn't leave Lazarus sick. The resurrection was complete. But let me tell you, and I wanna finish with this, God wants to resurrect those Esthers that Satan has tried to kill. Because he wants to leave a generation silent. He doesn't want us to take on our calling. He wants us dead. He wants us with the title of Christians, but with no power. And the enemy has tried to kill. That is always his goal, to steal, to kill, to destroy. But just as Jesus breathed life over my Esther, he's gonna breathe over you because you are the Esther generation. You are a bold generation. Why don't you get on your feet? And I just want to make a quick prayer. If you need God to breathe life, because maybe the enemy had killed your calling. He had tried to destroy. When I was praying afterwards, I'm like, God, why did this happen to us? It's the worst thing. It's a parent's worst nightmare, honestly. And God said, what the enemy wanted for evil, I transformed for good. And he told me, remember, she's Esther. I gave you her name, Esther, because she represents a generation that the enemy has been trying to kill. And let me tell you, the enemy has been trying to silence this generation's voice. You don't even know the power you have in you. When you speak up, you're being the generation that's gonna save this generation. That's what Esther did. She spoke up and she saved her generation. If you wanna be that Esther, just lift up your hands, truly, and say, Father, here I am. I'm willing to be bold. I'm willing to be that Esther generation. Breathe your life. Breathe your power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may be bold for such a time as this. That I may be bold with the truth of your word for such a time as this. Father, I just pray, breathe over every young person in this place, wherever they're from, whatever nation they're coming from. I pray, Father, breathe your life that they may leave this place determined to be that voice, to be the voice of those who have no voice, to be bold, to stand for what your prayer said, your word stands for. I pray in Jesus' mighty name, bold and not silent, Amen and amen. Let's give God praise for the ministry of Sarah Castellanos. Come on, come on. Lay your hand on somebody's shoulder. If it's on the right and left, that's fine. Turn to both of them and say, live. live. Come on, come on, be bold. Live. live. Hallelujah, let's give God praise again. God bless you. Let's go. God bless you guys. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college, but not sure what to expect, then visit us for one of our Quest Leadership events. Join us for this action-packed, fun-filled, spirit-empowered experience at ORU. Visit classes, attend a Golden Eagle sporting event, worship in chapel, and meet new friends. 
Want to advance your career but can't move to Tulsa? Then ORU has what you need with convenient online undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Don't wait. You can experience ORU's unique whole person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at ORU.edu.